doing today? Guess what? Christmas time is here. Isn't it so exciting? Celebrating the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ. We would like to invite you to stand. And before we start singing, being socially distant, just look around and say hi to the people that we have in here. Say hello. How are you doing? Good morning. You look beautiful. It's so good that you showered today.
Lord, this morning we gather to worship your name. We're thankful for this time of worship and thankful for all of the blessings that you pour in our lives, Father, every day, through everything, through family, through friendship, through food, the ability to wake up every morning in our beds. It's such a blessing, Father, and we are thankful because we know that there's people that do not have that privilege. So we thank you, Father. We ask you this morning that you will allow your word to impact our hearts and change the way we think, the way we act, the way we relate to others, the way we love people. We need you, Jesus. We're so happy that we get to celebrate yet one more year that you came to this earth as a little baby to dwell among us and ultimately to pay the sacrifice that our sin needed to pay. But you paid it and you made us new, you made us clean. So we're very thankful for that, Father. In the name of Jesus, the name that is above all other names, in the name of Jesus Christ. We pray these things, Lord, and God's people say, Amen. Will you give a hand to the Lord because He's worthy of celebration? You guys may be seated. Unto us is born a Savior, Christ the Lord. This is good news of great joy. The candle we light today is the candle of joy, reminding us the joy our Savior brings through life everlasting. Matthew 1, 21. You shall call his name Jesus, for it is he who will save his people from their sins. Each of us has distinguishing characteristics that make us unique. People identify us by our traits. These are our special features. They separate us from all the other people in the world who have names like ours. It may be our laugh, possibly it is our smile, or it could be the things that we find funny, our expressions, or the sound of our voice. These traits are fixed in their memories, our hobbies, our temperament, and our relationship with them. The sum of these things, and so many more, conjure up the images that others recall when they hear our names. When the name Jesus is mentioned, what is the singular outstanding characteristic that most people connect with his name? Without a doubt, it is his love. No one has ever loved us like Jesus. Unlike our love, his love is not intimidated by pain. We avoid pain and discomfort, and rightfully so. He did not avoid it. Instead, he chose it. His love is powerful. 
In another world, Jesus was ever so safe. There was no death, no suffering, no pain, no sorrow, no rejection or betrayal. He was wanted, powerful, cherished, and safe could describe his heavenly home. Yet he stepped out of his safe home and came into our hazardous world. Why? So that someday we could leave our hazardous world and live in his safe home. He gives us the power to live forever. His love caused him to choose the very things we avoid so that we could be citizens in his better place world someday. He walked on our planet in the skin of a man he understands what we feel and think when we come to him in prayer. He faced all our hazards. The angel said, You shall call this name Jesus. Could an angel understand what that name would come to mean to us? Is it possible that a pile of sins in human hearts causes us to see the power in his love that the angel cannot fully appreciate? Calling his name brings wonder. It brings praise. It brings hope. It makes life in us celebrate. Jesus. Wonderful name, wonderful Savior, wonderful love, Jesus the Christ. Let's pray. Oh God, thank you for the daily gift of your Son, Jesus. We cannot praise you enough. Let my joy shine forth so that those cloaked by sadness may find their sorrow lifted. I ask this for the sake of your glory. In your name, amen. churches that, uh, well, generally speaking, I just feel like people don't come out if there's a reason to come out in the snow, I should say, not, not in general, but uh, it's exciting to see all of you guys here this morning, and so many of you that uh, are just willing to, you know, whatever the roads are, I was uh, driving around late last night, um, there was a huge accident on C-470, and uh, just, you know, we were just coming home from, from uh, going shopping, and it, it was you know, it wasn't that bad, but it was bad enough to where it was causing just, you know, cars left and right to go off and stuff, and it was just kind of crazy. And so uh, I wasn't sure what it was going to be like this morning, and uh, I'm so excited to see you all here and to have you with us. Um, I have a couple of announcements to, uh, to say before we get started. So we have, uh, as a tradition here at the church, every year um, for I don't even know how long, um, but uh, we have the uh, Christmas musical for the children, okay? And this year is the Christmas quiz, all right? Um, we have this, uh, this will be next week on the 20th, and uh, the kids are, are practicing for this, they're working hard at this, um, and uh, there's going to be some, it's just going to be a fun time uh, coming together around, uh, before Christmas Eve and uh, just getting to hear the kids uh, do their thing and uh, also just getting to participate ourselves a little bit too. It'd be a lot of fun. So um, if you have children that are uh, looking to be involved in this, there's rehearsals that are happening. There's a rehearsal Friday night and Saturday, I believe. So check with Jackie downstairs. Uh, she has the details of when those will be, and uh, we'd love to, to have you guys participate with that. So uh, that's uh, first announcement here. The other announcement, um, if you can go back a slide actually to the YouTube slide. Um, so we are live streaming. We are broadcasting live online now. This is something that we haven't been able to do much of the year, and we've been able to get it going here for a few weeks now. Uh, but you'll notice that this has a super long link that is really convoluted, and none of you want to type that in, okay? I don't blame you. So if you go to YouTube and you search FCC Arvada, we'll come up, we're gonna be the result for that. Um, you'll, you'll see our, our uh, little emblem there, our icon um, that you are able to click on. Um, but what I want to point out too is uh, after we hit a certain amount of subscribers, we actually get a different URL and we're getting close. So if you guys have not gone to YouTube yet and signed up and, or, and subscribed to that channel, 
it will help us to get something that's a little bit easier to put online and, and market and put around, okay? So, and, and share with people. You can just say youtube.com slash FCCRvada um, once, once we get uh, enough subscribers. So that's only, I think, like 37 more subscribers we need or something like that before that happens. Not that many. So uh, if you guys haven't done that already, we would love for you to do that. Um, that'll help us out. And uh, it also gives us some other account privileges and stuff too. So that's pretty cool. Um, but uh, today, um, I am excited uh, because we are nearing closer and closer. This is going to sync on me today. Um, we are nearing closer and closer to Christmas. And uh, as we get closer to Christmas, last week we talked about the anticipation of the Savior and the anticipation that we have and the, just the things that God is doing in our life here. And, and uh, through this whole year, it's been a difficult year, right? And so this week, I wanted to talk about another story from the Gospels. Uh, we, we covered John 1, the, the first verses of John 1 last week, and we mentioned John the Baptist. And who is this man, John the Baptist? Uh, what, what, what is his role in all of this? Why is he important? And what do we need to, what do we need to know about him? And instead of talking directly about him, I thought maybe we should talk about kind of the things around him. Um, what, what brought him about um, as we look to Christ because he's the forerunner of Christ. So um, if I were to, you know, bring up a, a couple in the Bible who uh, they had been barren their entire life. They were getting very, very old in years. They were long past the point of being able to have a child. You guys would probably default to Abraham and Sarah, right? But that's not the only example of that happening to an older couple. John the Baptist's parents were in that same predicament. And we're going to talk about them today. Um, and the title of the sermon is A Promise Given. Because this is a season of promise, and it is a season of promise fulfilled. When I was a kid, I remember uh, I, had to, I had a really good friend. Uh, we would stay at his house, and he was a very wealthy friend, or his parents were, I should say. Um, they had a huge house. They had a hot tub in the backyard, and I remember during the winter we would get in the hot tub, and then we would jump into the snowbank and like freeze, and it'd sting, and then we'd jump back into the hot tub, and it'd sting some more. We would jump on the trampoline. They had one of those trampolines that was cut into the ground, so you just like walk onto it instead of having to climb up on top of it, and uh, we would jump on that thing in a big old huge backyard. We had an Easter egg hunt there one year. It was massive backyard, and uh, we also... Uh, they had a movie theater inside their house, uh, one of those like really nice home entertainment systems. And uh, you know, I, I've worked in audiovisual. I love a good home uh, home theater. And and I just remember growing up with this uh, this friend who had these things, right? And and uh, one of the, one of the things that uh, I don't know why this is the case, but his mom one time when I was uh, spending the night at their house, and uh, his mom one time decided she was going to show me. They're family uh, heirlooms and jewels. And I was like 12, okay? Um, and she, she pulls out from, from their hiding spot these gorgeous necklaces and gold and diamonds. And they had earrings and bracelets and all this stuff. And I was like, my goodness, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm raised a pastor kid. I had not seen this. this is, and even my, even people who I had met who were wealthy, they didn't have this stuff that they were showing a 12 year old. Okay. This was, this was like stuff you had seen in like a, like a Pirates of the Caribbean movie or something. You're looking at just this, all this like treasure. And, uh, she's like, promise that you'll never tell anyone where this is. I said, I promise. And I, you know, I, I said, I'm a really good secret keeper. Right. And, uh, well, you know, this, this, Hiding spot, it was in the fireplace. And that's not the first time I've told their secret. They don't live there anymore, they're long gone. I don't even know where they live anymore because we honestly don't even talk anymore. But I remember the first time that I told that secret, I felt terrible. 
And it was like a, 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 my conscience got pricked. And I realized I had betrayed a trust, even though they probably didn't care because they had moved by that point too. But it, it, it really did. It was, it was a broken promise. Because I break promises all the time. And in our, in our country, in our culture, we're, we're used to breaking promises. We're, we're used to people betraying our trust, and we're used to betraying other people's trust. Now, it might not have been her smartest idea to tell a 12-year-old that, but nonetheless, I have been entrusted with that. And we see politicians on TV making promises to us, and then the next thing we know, they're just doing the exact opposite. What are they doing? Why, I voted for you. What, what, is, what is going on here? Why are you doing it this way? Or why are you saying this thing? Um, or we have friends who, you know, they promise to keep a secret. And next thing you know, 90 different people know about it. Um, I remember uh, when we were uh, first pregnant with uh, our daughter, Millie, um, you know, we were, we were trying to keep it, you know, kind of under wraps until we hit that, that 20 week mark that, uh, you know, we, we told our family, our very, you know, our close family, but, and, and we told maybe a couple friends. But the next thing you know, we had people that we had no idea knew coming up to us and saying, oh, I'm so excited for you. I just heard you were pregnant. I'm, I'm, this is your first, right? I'm so excited. Uh, yeah, well, who did you hear from? Uh, we're used to this. And unfortunately, we're also guilty of it. A lot of times, we're guilty of betraying the trust, whether it's uh, saying, yes, I'll take out the trash and not doing it, um, or whether it's saying, I'll, I'll be there at this time and we're late. It could be a small broken promise, it could be a big broken promise, but a promise broken is still a promise broken. And the story we're going to study today is about a promise that God made. It's about a couple who their entire life they had not had a child. It was something that was a deep desire in their heart. If you guys would open with me to Luke 1, we're going to study in Luke 1, 1 through 28. Luke 1, 1 through uh, 28. And I'll have it up here on the, on the screen as well, um, but if you guys would follow along with me. Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us, it seems good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah. And he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. They were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and the statutes of the Lord. But they had no child because Elizabeth was barren, and both were advanced in years. Now, while he was serving as priest before God, when his division was on duty, according to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And the whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of incense. And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him, and he feared, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard, and your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, 
with uh, gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great before the Lord, and he must not drink wine or strong drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord the people prepared. And Zechariah said to the angel, how shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife is advanced in years. And the angel answered him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. And I was sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. And behold, you will be silent and unable to speak until the day that these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time. And the people were waiting for Zechariah, and they were wondering at his delay in the temple. And when he came out, he was unable to speak to them. And they realized that he had seen a vision in the temple, and he kept making signs to them and remained mute. And while his time of service was ended, he went to his home. After these days, his wife Elizabeth conceived. And for five months she kept herself hidden, saying, Thus the Lord has done for me in the days when he looked on me to take away my reproach among the people. What a cool story. Things that science had thought impossible were accomplished. Things that God promised were fulfilled. We know a lot of the promises of Scripture, and today we're going to look at these a little bit, but we're going to break this down because there's a lot here. This is a big chunk of, of Scripture, okay? And I'm not, I'm not unfamiliar that this is a lot of verses to cover in one day, but to take it all together in its context and to take it all together, we need to take it at once. I don't want to break this up into multiple. Um, and as we look towards this Christmas season and the promise that God would send us a Savior, it's important for us to understand that when God makes a promise, it's something that he keeps. The first part is Luke 1, 1 through 4. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because I could probably spend a whole bunch of time on it. And it's, it's just kind of an intro to the book here. But we have a few things that I do want to point out is that Luke was uh, the, also the writer of Acts, okay? And this was potentially prepared, uh, very different from the other Gospels, this was pre potentially prepared as a legal defense. Um, that, that's been a floated theory of why this was written, but it's very exacting in how he wrote it. Uh, it's very much, he really sought to research and investigate, to go through and verify all of these things that happened for history's sake and for Theophilus as he was presenting it to him. Theophilus is the most excellent, so we don't know who this is. It could have been Luke's literary uh, patron, the, the person who was paying for him to do this. It could have been um, a judge or, or something, um, but we just know that he calls him most excellent, and that's a honorific title. That's not something that just everyone gets told. Okay, And as he writes this book, he wants us to know, as it's shared with us today, as it was with Theophilus, you may have certainty of the things that are written. You may have certainty of the things that are written. Because he's trying to convince someone of the incredible things that happened in the life of Christ. From beginning to end, he's trying to say, these things happened. I have done the research. I have looked at it. So what comes next... Trust me. Luke 1, 5 through 7. In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah, the division of Abijah. And he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes 
of the Lord. But they had no child because Elizabeth was barren, and both were advanced in years. Now, when we've made promises, we probably haven't made a promise quite as big as what the angel Gabriel makes, right? We're not promising anyone that I can guarantee you a son. Um, I've had friends who've, who've gone through um, a, a tough time in their life where they were infertile. They were not able to have kids, or they were struggling with miscarriage, and it, just the, the, the brokenness that they felt during that time was immense. They would come to, to our group each week, and, and it was something that just weighed on them. They, as we sat and we prayed together, we would pray every single week for, for God to just open their, her womb and, and to bless their, their marriage and their, their life together and their family with a child. Um, it's, a, it's a difficult thing, and, and as we've had kids, we found that it's, it's more common than uh, we, we really ever realized. Lots of people in our life that we know have struggled with the same thing. And yet, these were also very good people. But before I go into how good they were, I want to talk about Herod. Because all it does is say, Herod, king of Judea. That's not a whole lot about him. But we know a whole lot about him. I, I actually, as I was researching and, and studying who he was, uh, the first thing that I watched was a YouTube video on BBC about Herod. It basically was like, oh, well, he's got a bad rap because of this one verse in the Bible. And, uh, you know, other than that, you know, he's, he's not that bad. I mean, he, he might have, you know, ordered, uh, you know, genocide of a city's children under the age of two. But, you know, other than that, he's really a great guy. And there's no historical evidence to, to back that account, so we just should toss that out like it's not actually important, right? But as and this is this is what the, the BBC documentary was arguing for, and then you do a little bit of research and you come to find out that he had three of his sons murdered. So infanticide is not really a uh, um, thing that's out of the question for this man. He was a terrible man. He killed three of his sons. He also ordered his father killed. So. Uh, uh, what is that? Patricide? <laughs> he, he killed his father. <laughs> he killed, uh, I think, something like 40. He ordered 45 friend, close friends and family members uh, killed. And the joke was made about this man that it was better to be a pig in his house, a literal pig, oink, than a family member or a friend because he didn't eat pork. <laughs> <laughs> so he wouldn't kill the pigs. He had no reason to. And that was from Caesar Augustus, supposedly, who made that comment. We know him from the decree that was sent out, and he was the first ruler of the empire, of the Roman Empire. This man is not a good man, and all we see in this account is in the days of Herod, king of Judea. He was a a very, very strong ruler, a very, very harsh ruler. I don't even want to go into the idea of how many slaves probably died at his hand. He had Masada built, uh, something we know very well. That's uh, where the, the Roman Empire, when the Roman Empire was trying to conquer Masada, that's where, you know, they, they all held up there, and then when they finally conquered it, they had all committed suicide. Um, the Sakari, the, the Jewish assassins, that was kind of their fortress um, at the time. Uh, he built that thing to withstand a siege that was massive. He was, he was a great builder, but he was still a terrible man. He accomplished a lot of different things in his life, but he was an awful, awful person. And under his reign, is when this takes place. When the birth of John the Baptist and when the birth of Jesus Christ takes place. To draw a contrast, because I think it was pretty apparent to everyone at this time, the contrast here, it might not be apparent to us, but he's saying, Herod, king of Judea, terrible man, and then these were good, righteous people. Zechariah, a priest, and his wife also from priestly lineage, okay? And they were people you would love to spend time with. 
They were people who no one had complaints about. They were people who were righteous before God. And, and they, these, were, these were good people. These were people that you would go to for advice and wisdom and counsel. They were people who loved on their neighbors. And they loved God. But they had no child. And they were advanced in years. When they say advanced in years, they mean past the age of childbearing. So we don't know exactly how old they are, but they're, they're at least past 60 is what the kind of the assumption is. They could be much older than that. We don't really know. But it is something that uh, was impossible for them, and it was a miracle what happens. These were dark days. And the reality about dark days, and the reality about where the story is, is that dark days are a starting point for God. This year might have felt like a dark year for many people. It's just a starting point for God. It's an opportunity, it's, it's fertile soil for the gospel to go out. It just needs people who will carry it. These were terrible days. And just a, a little bit more about them. Zechariah, his name means God remembers. And Elizabeth's name, to summarize it, means God gives. And there's just something super cool about that. The fact that it is God remembers and God gives. Because we see in these next few verses here. Now while he was serving as a priest before God, when his division was on duty, according to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And the whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of incense. And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw, uh, when he saw him, and fear fell upon him. But the angel, the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayers, and your prayer has been heard. And your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great before the Lord. And he must not drink wine or strong drink, and he will be filled with the Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. And when he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. God gives us a promise and he hears our prayers. God gives us a promise, and he hears our prayers. See, the odds of, um, the odds of, we'll go back there, Zechariah being the one chosen to go into the uh, burning incense on that day were like a thousand to one or something like that. I mean, there were so many priests. We see that he was um, a priest in, of his division on duty, okay? And when you were chosen to do this, when you were chosen at random, because that's what casting of lots is, you were chosen completely at random, you only were able to do it one time. So if someone was chosen at random, that was it for the rest of their life. This is literally the, the high point for him. This is, this is the pinnacle, this is the greatest honor, this is the opportunity of a lifetime for him as a priest. He gets to go in and burn the incense. And everyone outside is waiting in anticipation, and there's a multitude of people. But God wasn't just in the appearance of the angel. See, the odds were that he wouldn't be chosen. And so even before the angel appears, God is already orchestrating Zechariah to be the one who receives this message. He ordered the events before Zechariah even knew there was a game at play. He already knew, God already had a plan and a set path 
for Zechariah to be the one who would step inside to burn the incense and see the angel Gabriel. This was all orchestrated. And when God gives us a promise and he, he hears our prayers, oftentimes things are already in the work that we didn't even know. Oftentimes God is already moving in our life and we had no idea. Um, the prayer of uh, Zechariah, the angel of the Lord, refers to his prayer in the passage. It's not a prayer for a son, actually, that he's probably referring to, according to the grammar in this. The prayer that the angel Gabriel says that he heard is actually the prayer that he was supposed to be praying as a part of the one burning the incense, which was that a Savior would come. What's also incredible is that God heard his private prayer. So while God heard the prayer of Israel to, to, to bring a, a Messiah, a King, a, a Savior who would take away their reproach like we saw last week, he also heard at the same time throughout Zechariah's whole life this desire that was in his, him and his wife's heart to have a child. So there's two prayers that are being answered here. We, we might think it was just one, but there's really actually two when you look at it in, in the Greek. And it's important for us to recognize that because so often we come to God and we, we, we come to pray and we're asking for one thing and there's so many things. And God is working in all of it. Um, I wanted to, to share a story from, this is from five years ago, and it was a time when I was wrestling with God, and I was just really wanting to see God speak. I was wanting to see God hear my prayers and answer them. It was a time when I was wanting to see if, if really, if, if, if the God that, that uh, you know, I had come accustomed to in the church was, you know, a God that you know, just seemed impersonal and kind of disconnected. Or if it was, if it was someone, if he was a God who really saw me and was working in this world. And uh, I was on a, a missions trip in Honduras. Um, and, and before we went on this trip, um, we had a, a just kind of a, a, a night of prayer where we had people come in and together as a big group, we all just prayed for the events of that missions trip. We asked that, that God would bring people into our paths that, that we could share the gospel with and that we could have people brought into our paths that we could benefit their life, restore dignity or, or just assist them in some way and love on them as Christ would love on them. We, we did this kind of exercise, and it was a really weird exercise for me because I didn't grow up in this, and I, didn't, I had never experienced something like this before. It was just pray for God to give you an image in your mind, and then you draw the image. Well, I love drawing, so that wasn't the hard part. For me, I just didn't believe that, that I would get an image in my mind that meant anything. And so I, I, I prayed, and I said, God, Lord, would you speak to me? I'm just going to give you the benefit of the doubt here. <laughs> and and I, I'm, not, I'm not totally believing that this is going to be something that happens. But would you just show me a, a sign? Would you show me something, a picture in my mind that, that might be a cue later on? And I got this, this picture in my mind of a little boy. And he was wearing bright blue and bright orange clothing. And he was sitting on a brick wall around some tin roofs. I'm like, okay. <laughs> uh, I don't know what that's about, but I drew it, and you know, because I like to draw, I drew it, you know, pretty darn well, and uh, you know, it's, it's something that I was like, all right, you know, I've got the best artwork in the room now, and you know, <laughs> it, uh, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't something that I was really taking very seriously. Well, fast forward a couple of weeks, we were, we were down there for uh, just over two weeks, and um, we went to all sorts of different places while we were down there. We were in the middle of the jungle working with, um, uh, was it the, I think it was the Mayan uh, descendants who were there. Um, we were working with um, truck dealers in these villages. And I mean, it's, it was just, it was crazy. We were, we were 
crossing boundaries probably we shouldn't have been crossing in, in normal logical circumstances and all this stuff. And it was so awesome. I was seeing my, my best friend who's Haitian um, on our trip. He, uh, he was sharing the gospel because he could speak Spanish, but the rest of us couldn't. And it was just cool to see how God was just using that uh, language um, ability to be able to share the gospel with these people. And they were just left and right people were coming to Christ. It was so awesome to see I, and I don't speak any Spanish. I mean, I, I know uh, one word, uh, uh, an idiom from Honduras. It's chequeleca pancake, which means okie dokie pancake. Okay, and that's literally that's like they're okay. Like that was something they would say as uh, like responding to you, saying okay, you know, kind of a funny version of that. And that's that's what I remember. I mean, I know you know some basic you know greeting and stuff, but that's it. I'm not, I'm not very good with that language. And so, I, and I love languages. Um, but for me, you know, we're getting to the end of our time there. And I, you know, that, that image was still, you know, in my journal. It was still something that I had and I hadn't seen anything from it. You know, I, I, I don't know. I'm like, well, maybe it's just stupid. Maybe I just saw Broncos on TV or something. And I thought, Broncos. And I walked in the building. The building was red bricks and red bricks. And, I don't know where the tin roof came from. I can't figure that one out. But we decided to have kind of like a vacation day. Pretty common when you're on a trip towards the end. Maybe you take a day off and you just rest. And we went to this um, place. It was, I think, the, the Valley of Angels or something like that is what it's called. And we were up on this hilltop. It was gorgeous. I mean, so gorgeous. The clouds were floating through the tops of the, the mountains, and everything was so green. I've grown up in Colorado, so I'm not totally accustomed to a lot of green, green forest. And before that, it was in Texas, still not accustomed with green, green forest. And so it's just gorgeous. And we're looking down, and, and this particular area had just really gorgeous uh, red uh, shingled roofs, uh, clay, clay shingles, and just nice buildings. It was a tourist destination, you know, it was made up tourist destination. And then I'm, I'm looking around and we're about to take our, our team photo. And I look around and, and I was like, oh, I had not seen this anywhere. The, the particular kind of brick, that red brick, like we might see here, right? But a little bit more bright. This red brick, I had not seen anywhere in Honduras because everything was cinder block down there. And I, 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 saw, I saw the red brick, and I was like, huh, that's, that's weird. Well, maybe I need to walk over there or something. I don't know. So I start, I start kind of, you know, walking towards that, and I'm like, there, there's, ten, there's ten roofs. What? Like, okay, that's not super uncommon, but it's not, you know, it, it, it's whatever. I'm just going to keep going with this because, you know, there's a hope in me. There's a little bit of a fire that's being kindled. Um, and I turn around, and like I said, my team is trying to take their team photo right now. So they're, what the heck is this kid doing? Um, and I, I turn around and I look and I see this little kid sitting on a red brick wall wearing bright orange and bright blue. I'm like, oh no. <laughs> like, I don't wanna, no, 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 no. I don't, I don't wanna engage with this. I don't wanna do this. This is, this is not me. This is not, this is not what I learned. This is not how I've experienced it before. And I don't, I don't speak Spanish. I can only say chacaleca pancake and um, <laughs> you know, maybe say hi to this kid. <laughs> and so that's just gonna be a really awkward conversation. So here we go. I, I, I hyped myself up. I walk over to this kid who's literally sitting on the wall there. And I walk over to him and I, I say, hey, how are you? And as any little kid should do, looks at a stranger, grown person talking to him who just sat down next to him, gives him a creeped out, totally like slightly fearful look and sits there for maybe like 30 seconds and tries to talk with me and then runs off, right? And I'm like, <laughs> that, was, that was interesting. <laughs> That's, uh, that was awkward. Uh, now I look like a total creep in Honduras. And I don't know if they know Stranger Danger down there, but I'm pretty sure that's universal. Um, and there's this man who's sitting there. He has his wife and his wife's sister with him. And I hadn't met a single person in Honduras other than the, the workers we were there with who, spe who spoke English, right? I, I just, no one down there spoke English. 
Um, we had been in Capone and we had driven through and you know, we ended up in uh, Tegus, Tegucigalpa and what's crazy is this man just out of nowhere, I literally ran into his truck and I still didn't speak anyone who knew English. He says, you're not from around here, are you? Perfect English. I'm like, that caught my attention because I'm like, someone speaks my language. I turn and I look at him and say, yeah, what gave it away? He said, come over here. I said, okay. So I go over and I start talking to this man. I say, you know, like, what's your name? You know, my name is Michael. And it's like, uh, he's like, this is my wife and this is my wife's sister. And that's her kid running around here. And um, this, uh, you know, you're from America, obviously. <laughs> you're from the U.S. Uh, yeah, like, how, how do you speak English so well? Because, uh, like I said, I didn't meet anyone. So I was like, I'm just astonished by this dude has a flawless accent. And he's like, well, I, I was a cook in California for many years. I was a chef, and, and you know, I owned a couple of restaurants, and, and then, uh, you know, I, my, my sister's husband passed, and they needed some help down here, and so we just, my wife and I decided to come back down and kind of help her get stabilized and, and come alongside them. And I'm like, oh, okay, that's really cool. And, you know, I'm thinking, I'm like, all right, this is the guy I'm going to share the gospel with. Let's get going. Let's, let's figure out what's, what's, the, what's the end with this guy. Right? And um, what came next was just blew my mind. Um, he shared with me, not all of a sudden, you know, I started trying to talk about God, and he's like, oh, yeah, I believe in God. And, and you know, um, I'm like, okay, well, maybe I'm not just supposed to share the gospel with him. What, what am I supposed to do? And um, I have a few of these guys. These are just, you know, a, a notebook I bought a bunch of these from Walmart over the years and I used them for prayer journals and I had a list of prayers that I had written out about 20 ish prayer requests or, or things that I had been talking to God about and as him and I talked it was like he was going down my list just giving me advice or, or talking about things that had happened in his life and I was like well, this is, this is not what I expected. I was expecting for God to do a work through me in someone else's life, right? No, this wasn't about that. This was God saying, I see you. I hear your prayer. And I want to show you that I, I see all of those different prayer requests on your list. It wasn't an answer to those prayers per se. But it was an answer to the prayer that I said on that night when I said, God, I, just, I want to see if you're really listening, if you're hearing me. These prayers that we make, sometimes we just forget we made a prayer. I think a lot of people are praying in this world. I think a lot of atheists are praying in this world. I think, you know, they, they say there's no atheists in foxholes. I, I'm pretty sure there's just no atheists in general because, honestly, there's, there's a lot of people who are in need. They're talking to someone, whether it's themselves or, you know, that, that person who is imaginary in the mind. They're, they're praying. God is hearing those prayers, too. God is hearing those requests in their life. But so few of us are really documenting prayer requests. So few of us are really taking a, a second to say, like, this is what I asked God. And then going back in to their prayer journal and saying, oh, my goodness, God answered this prayer. In, uh, in, in uh, it's the it's July 13, 2016, financial needs, credit card debt, car debt, taxes, I had medical bills from a emergency medical surgery that I had to have um, to have my gallbladder removed because I had gallstones and I got pancreatitis from it. And uh, massive bill, I mean, we're talking $80,000. And by this point, you know, some of that had been paid down and some of that had disappeared. Um, but I had a huge, a huge medical bill, school debt, a ring to be able to get engaged. Yeah, a honeymoon, because after you propose and you go through the wedding, you get the honeymoon, internship costs, a wife and family I have written priceless. <laughs> True story. The wedding costs, I wrote all of those down with dollar amounts. And I can look back and see how within a matter of three months, God had taken care of all of those expenses. Just... I, that Christmas, I got a, a, a check in the mail 
from my grandparents, and they, you know, they, they weren't in real communication with us at that point. They had no idea what had been going on in my life with the surgery and everything like that. Um, and this check came at the, such an opportune moment that it just, not only did it start taking some of these bills away that I had, it also paid, it paid for the, the ring, the wedding, the, you know, our, our part of the wedding, because, you know, obviously my, my, you know, wife's parents took care of a number of things, but, um, it took care of our honeymoon. It helped us to be able to go on our internship, but we tried to raise money for our internship and we ended up blowing that out of the water as well. And, and the medical bills, literally over $80,000 in medical bills that I was liable for, um, they got waived and I had to pay a hundred bucks. All of this happened within a few months of me writing that prayer request. And I can look back and say, oh my goodness, this God went through line by line and answered all of these things. I can do that with so many others because I've, I've got three or four or five of those things now. Um, I can go back years and say, for the last five years since I started journaling, because I grew up and I was not a journaler, okay? I had like, you know, prayer diary. <laughs> no, I just said, you know what? I need to do this. This is not something that, you know, it's not a, you know, I, I kind of grown up with the idea that this might be like a, a, a a girly thing will say. I had to reprogram myself to say, no, this is something that is between me and God. I need to, I need to, it has nothing to do with that. It has everything to do with seeing how God has moved in your life. God gives us promises and he hears our prayers. Habakkuk 1, uh, this is a prayer, you know, the, the book of Habakkuk is a prayer and a conversation between the prophet and God. And, and God responds to Habakkuk's prayer and says, Look among the nations and see, wonder, and be astounded, for I am doing a work in your days that you would not believe if you were told. Today, this is something that's happening as well. We might look around this world and say, Oh my goodness, where are you, God? Why, why is this person why is this person in charge? Or, or why is this happening in our world? Or why is this grievance happening? And he would say, look and be astounded. I am doing something that you would not believe, even if I told you. And then he proceeds to tell him. And it's pretty incredible. And it's far more intricate than Becky ever would have imagined. And I'm guessing that God didn't even tell him the whole deal. <laughs> Luke 1, 18-21. And Zechariah said to the angel, How shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife is advanced in years. There's the apple. And the angel answered said, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I was sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. I, I, I kind of, when I read this, I think a little bit of frustration in Gabriel's voice. Maybe that's wrong, but that's how I kind of read this. And behold, you will be silent and unable to speak until the day that these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time. And the people were waiting for Zechariah, and they were wondering at his delay in the temple. So there's still a ton of people outside, like, did he pass out there? What the, do we, need to, do we need to send someone in to rescue him? Like, what's going on here? Um, let's just keep praying, and this is like, you know, just continues to go on. <laughs> God keeps his promises. And this is something we forget. It's something we take for granted. It's something we don't live into. This is a season of promise fulfilled. Christmas is about generations of promises that were being made. Years and decades, centuries and millenniums promises being made that we're coming to a culmination on Christmas we're coming to a culmination with Christ's coming God keeps his promises God also promised that one would come who would pave the way for the Messiah and that was John Zechariah's son Elizabeth's son John the Baptist. God keeps his promises. 
Hebrews 6, 13 through 15, for when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself, saying, surely I will bless you and multiply you. And thus Abraham, having patiently waited, obtained the promise. For, uh, 2 Corinthians 1, 20, for all the promises of God find their yes in him. That is why it is through him that we utter our amen to God for his glory. But here we have an issue. Many of us don't even know the promises of God. We're not familiar with the promises of God because we never spend time reading them. We never spend time hearing from him. It's hard for someone to make a promise when you never hear them speak. It's, never, it's hard for them to make that promise when you haven't given them the time. You've got the earplugs in. You've got your earbuds in, your AirPods in, whatever. You're, you're not listening to God. You're not spending time with God. Your friends can break, make promises because you're spending time with your friends. Your family can make promises because you're spending time with your friends or your family. You, I can make promises to you because we're here together right now. But we don't spend time listening to God. The only person, the only one who actually has a 100% track record of following through on his promises. The only person. <clears throat> so what are the promises of God? The scripture is filled with these. Okay, and I'll read a few of them here that I thought might be relevant for us today. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak over Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord, and my right hand is disregarded by my God. Have you not known, have you not heard? The Lord is an everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. Isaiah 40, 29-31. He gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might, he increases strength. I love this verse. This is one of my favorite verses in the Bible. Even though youth shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. Okay? Things that would tap out our most fit athletes. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up on wings like eagles. With wings like eagles. They shall not run, or they shall run and not become weary. They shall walk and not faint. I love that. I love that. D, you're a good example of that. <laughs> Galatians 6, 9. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. So many of us are longing to make an impact. So many of us are longing to see people reach for Christ. We have a promise that if we do not give up, we will see fruit. Matthew 6, 25-30. Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, nor what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns. And yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his lifespan? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat? What shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things. And your Heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Finally, one last, one last promise. There's so many more, but I just want to give you a few. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. As we wrap today and, and I pray, I, I want to 
I want to ask you guys, what is it you're praying? I got a chance this week to uh, go to the prayer meeting for the church, and I got to sit with 10 people who were willing to risk coming out in the middle of this COVID season um, and willing to come together and, and share about things that are happening in our church, things that are happening in their lives. There's need, there's hurt, there's also praise. So much praise. We have warriors who are here. But we have to remember what we pray. We have to remember that God is one who actually accomplishes those prayers. See, if we, if we give up on these things, then we're, we're missing so much of God manifesting himself in our world and in our life. The challenge for this week, going forward, as we look to next week in, in the Christmas season, I want you to spend time in the Word. If I can get you to do one thing today, I want you to spend time in the Word and spend time in prayer with God. I am praying that you would have that encounter with God, that He would show up for you in incredible ways during the season. If you guys would bow your heads with me. Father, we know you speak. We know you're not silent. We know that you're moving in our world, and Lord, you have made promises for us and for our children and for our grandchildren. You have made promises that those who believe in you will see blessing. Lord, that they will rise up on people's wings. They will not grow weary. They will not faint. Lord, that you will restore their souls. That, Lord, we can count it all joy trials and suffering, knowing that, that those trials and suffering, Lord, you promised that that would produce endurance. God, so much of your word is promises of you, from you to us. And I pray, Lord God, that we would encounter those, that we would spend time reading those, that we would spend time meditating on those, and seeing the impact on our lives, Lord. Lord, help us to see you in the so many ways that you, you bring yourself to us and, and reveal yourself to us, God. Go with us this week, Lord. We pray this in your son Jesus' name. Amen. We would like to invite you to stand so that we can sing, rejoice, the one more song. At the end of the service, if you need prayer, Dee is going to be right here next to the chapel, so make sure you can you go to her.
will see you next week.